All right, hey guys, this is John from FMS. I'm here today with Damon Wright, um, who, those of you coming to the summit, um, you heard Damon speak quite a bit this last time about um, legal issues and kind of what's been going on with um, the FTC and other cases. And because we saw there was a, uh, a new FTC notice that came out um, today, uh, I wanted to get Damon on uh, kind of last minute and talk about it since quite a few companies in the industry have been named um, and just get um, kind of an overview of what this means, what it is, what's going on, um, how scared should people be, uh, and, and so on. So again, Damon, thanks so much for coming in last minute. Um, you guys over at Gordon Rees have been awesome um, uh, when, when, we, when we have questions and stuff. So I really, really do appreciate this. My pleasure, John. Thanks for the opportunity. So, yeah, like, so, do you want to just like dive into it and like? Sure, what, sure. What, yeah. So, what, yeah. So, just just add background real quickly. So, I'm the chair of the advertising and e-commerce practice group at Gordon Reese. We're a firm of about 1,200 lawyers, and within the advertising and e-commerce group, we naturally represent a lot of financial publishers, and business coaches, and, and other companies that are talking with people about how they can improve their lives, how they've got to be able to make money, and. So we've been very busy uh, over the last couple of years, and especially over the last year. Uh, the FTC, uh, as we talked about at the Financial Marketing Summit, they've made this an enforcement priority to go after companies that are telling people that they can make money, uh, sometimes claims about making passive income or guaranteed income. Those are called earnings claims. Uh, if you go back in time, the FTC uh, for years has targeted multi-level marketing companies, MLMs, uh, as pyramid schemes. They've targeted uh, real estate flipping businesses, show up in the hotel ballroom to learn how to make money in real estate, but it's really more of a sales pitch. Uh, they've targeted, targeted for-profit colleges. And they announced uh, last December something called Operation Income Illusion to, said, to say, we're going to make this a priority. Uh, we're going to go after companies like this. And they uh, touted the fact that they brought a case before against Online Trading Academy. And that was a couple of years ago. And they also touted the fact in December that they just brought a case against Raging Bull, a pretty well-known financial publisher. What happened after that uh, is the FTC suffered a major loss before the US Supreme Court in this case called AMG Capital. Uh, and by major loss, they lost 9-0 before the U.S. Supreme Court. And if you know, if you follow the U.S. Supreme Court, it's pretty amazing that nine justices were able to agree on anything. And here they all agreed that for years, the FTC has been abusing its authority under this one statute. And that the statute did not give the FTC the authority, it's called Section 13B, did not give the FTC the authority to go into court in the way it had been and get asset freezes and money damages. Uh, and instead the FTC under this statute could only get injunctive relief, meaning they could only get a, a court to order some business to stop doing something as opposed to getting money. Well, with that decision, and on top of that, a new regime at the FTC, uh, in particular, the chair, uh, Lena Khan, who's 32 years old, uh, She's only a few years out of law school. Uh, she wrote some law review articles and, and really attracted the attention of Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and others. With, with that new regime and this Supreme Court decision, the FTC has come back with a vengeance. And it's, uh, you know, you take that operation income illusion, add the fact you've got a new regime that wants to be even more aggressive and uh, the FTC feeling like it's been knocked down. It, it basically, it's gotten up from a mat and is, punching back harder than ever. And so that's what we see with the notice of penalty that came out yesterday. Um, if you haven't heard this already, the notice of penalty, it's uh, right here. Notice of penalty offenses can trigger large civil penalties for companies from multi-level marketers to providers of gig work. And the FTC sent letters to over 1,100 companies. Uh, the list is here. The list is 29 pages long. And it includes- I'll post that with the video. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and 
you know, they, I, I can't say they went through the telephone book and just listed every single company, but it is quite long. It includes, a, you know, well-known companies from the gig economy, so DoorDash and Uber. It includes some financial publishers. It includes um, business coaches. It's a quite a long list. So what they're trying to do is make up for the fact they lost before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said this statute doesn't give you the, the ability to go into court and get damages, money the way you have. And they've sort of gone back to the books, looked at other statutes that haven't been used ever in this way and kind of dusted them off and said, okay, uh, you're not done with us. We're coming back hard. And now we're going to send these notice of policy violations. And if you violate uh, the, the notice, if you continue to do what we've targeted in the notice after receiving this, now we can go into court and ask the court to impose civil penalties. And the civil penalties can be as high as $43,000 per violation. So it's, um, you know, it could be catastrophic to this. So uh, we saw the same kind of thing about a week or so ago. Uh, again, a list of uh, lots of companies, many large brands, uh, and notice of policy violations that went out to those companies. And that uh, the focus there was on uh, in endorsements and influencers and not disclosing if someone was giving a testimonial, if they received any compensation for that. And that was, that was um, you know, such that kind of action had never really happened before, except a week before that, when they sent letters also to uh, for-profit colleges and, and made similar uh, assertions that they're, uh, they may be violating the law, they're on notice, and if you continue to do what we think you may be doing, we're not accusing you of it, but what you may be doing, we're gonna pursue you for penalties of $43,000. So I haven't really talked about the, the guts of what this all concerns. Um, I don't know if you if you want to stop there. If you have any questions? John. Well, just for a second, like so. So basically, what that is then is you have um, you have a new you have a new regime, new, new administration um, comes in, but more like excuse me, more fundamentally with the FTC, then they had kind of the the I'd say almost a punitive strategy they've been using against um, people that they felt were violating. Um, the law for the last, I don't know, 20 years? Is, is that about right? Like the, 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 the Supreme Court said, wait, you don't have that power. You can't go in and, and just freeze assets. You can't just go and take, you can't do that. Um, so their entire kind of model of dealing with how do they go out to a company that they're, they're, they're investigating and, and punish them got kind of taken off the table. And exactly. so this, so that means that now then we're looking at a period where they have a new regulatory framework or, or a new punitive framework or whatever whatever you want to call it. And they're going to be going out and looking for test cases to then create precedent. Is that, I mean, That's are they going to be going out and looking for like small companies that probably can't fight them very well? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, is yeah. that the fear? That is the fear. Yeah. So, so as you just said, what they did is they said, okay, Supreme Court, you ruled against us 9-0. We know we can't go down this path anymore. So we're going to pivot. And we've come up with a new path that we haven't used uh, hardly ever. And uh, in the past, maybe there'd be a notice of violation to one company or two companies or three companies, but we're going to send this blast out. Uh, you know, it happened around the time of COVID that they they didn't send these kinds of notices, but they sent a lot of warning letters out to companies that were making claims about how uh, CBD or vitamin C could uh, help prevent COVID. And they did it in a targeted way. And they actually said, here is the advertising we're concerned with. And we are putting on notice, you need to fix this. But they didn't use this avenue to say, and if you keep doing it, we're gonna come after you for $43,000. So this is new. Um, and it, again, it's it's because of the new regime. It's because they they are pivoting and uh, and they made this an enforcement priority. And so the line has really moved. There is ad copy that a couple of years ago probably wouldn't have um, gotten the FTC riled up that that now 
very much does. Right. Um, yeah. And but before we jump into some of the guts of of, yeah. of this, then um, the with with the kind of regime change, the in one sense, like when when they did the raging bull case, right? Like, I mean, in a lot of ways, even though that that you know they didn't necessarily win the case, like uh, the impact is. I think was effective because it scared the crap out of everybody. Right. Um, a lot of people pulled their promos down. They stopped spending money. They went and did further legal review. They went and did more examinations. Some people who weren't, and they should have, they should absolutely have been getting legal review on their copy who weren't started doing it. Like it had a, it had a direct impact. I think it had the impact that they wanted. Um, when it comes to like their, the, the FTC's goals, is your sense that, their primary goal in these kind of, with these kind of um, like operation income illusion, these big initiatives, is it, it's to change industry behavior or is it to punish bad actors? I mean, obviously, are they using the punishing of bad actors um, to, to change the, the, the behavior or is it really like, let's go out and just find as many people as possible and, and destroy them? I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it, it depends on who um, who it is at the FTC, but you know I think there are good people at the FTC who care about consumers, but are also know that that you can make money as a business and be doing good things. They're not mutually exclusive. Just because you made money doesn't mean you're tricking consumers. So there are people are people certainly who appreciate that, but they're they're you know, everyone's human, and there are people at the FTC who also are uh, maybe jaundiced and have a presumption that if a company is making money, they must be doing bad things. Uh, I wish I could say that the focus is always about trying to educate and inform business to do things a better way. I don't think that's always the focus. Um, or if it is, it's misguided sometimes. Um, and what I mean by that is, for instance, uh, with the new commissioner, the new chair, I should say, Lena Khan, when she took over at the FTC, she said effective immediately, uh, FTC lawyers are not allowed to go to industry conferences and speak before business and industry groups because our focus needs to be on protecting consumers, not on speaking you know, at junkets or trade shows or conferences. That seems outrageous to me. It's... Uh, you know, it'd be like saying we're not going to let the friendly police officer come to the school for career day uh, because right. police officers should just be um, out there, you know, making arrests. Uh, you know, I, I, so I, that, that kind of attitude is frustrating. You know, frankly, the, the FTC press releases when they go after a company are frustrating. So often they, they want to paint themselves as having just taken public enemy number one off the streets. But the reaction to that is people read that and think, wow, that company was a real bad actor. Right. I'm okay because I didn't do all those things. But the press release is spun to emphasize all of the negative without the context and the balance of, but the company actually did these two or three things right. Nevertheless, they still crossed the line. It's not balanced, it's slanted. It's not typical. <laughs> they, they, right. they maybe have cherry picked a few uh, instances of ad copy that are, you know, to say this is the composite, but it's really... Not so. I, I wish they were always focused on how to educate and inform, but sometimes the the approach is no. We're just going to make an example, and uh, and, and that, as we can that, see, that just you know, raging bull was one. But I think they're going to be others. That seems crazy to me that that they would they would actively discourage lawyers from speaking to um, industry, like um, because obviously, like you have at a certain level of business, it's, 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 it's much easier and everyone does end up having legal, um, help. But as, as you're starting out, like the, the newer businesses, like they don't have as, they, they can't have as much legal, um, they're just not have the budget. I mean, they don't, they don't have a budget for half the things that they need to do. Um, and so that's where they, they come and get educated about these things at things like conferences and they come, right. um, and, and, and so to, 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 to say that they you shouldn't do that just seems um, a little draconian in my mind that it's, it's almost like that idea that if you're in business, then you're, you're automatically like, it's an us versus them mindset, right. where if you're in business, then you're automatically bad. Like that, that seems very, very concerning that, um, and, 
that an agency like that would have that kind of a mindset because I mean, most of the people that I know in business, most of the people I know in publishing everywhere else, and there are, look, I, I know like there are people for sure who stretch limits in, in some cases we've seen places where like, okay, that was fraud. Like they should not have been able to, like, that's the kind of guy that the FTC, you, you think the FTC is there to, to, to ferret out and get rid of, but then you have all these really basically good actors who um, they're, they're trying their best to, to, to serve the customer um, and do it within the confines of what is appropriate and not appropriate based on what their understanding is of the law. Right. And it's not always that clear. Like it's not always that clear. Right. And that's, that's the really frustrating thing is if, if, if like people could, if we had like this, this is okay, this is not okay. Kind of a um, delineation of things that was black and white. It'd be very easy. But like every time we seem to get into these conversations, it's like, well, it depends. And it's in the depends is where it's kind of really confusing and, and, and right. risky. Um, right. Yeah, I can tell uh, you that, that about the uh, announcement about not speaking at conferences, most of the FTC rank and file, uh, the career people there, I, I think were very troubled, are very troubled by that. And it, it, yeah, I think, I, think, I think a lot of them would agree with you about the benefit of, of educating people that's 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 part of the, the mission right so. right yeah um so then let's see that it got to this particular like this penalty or notice of penalty like so what are the what are the kind of things that they're highlighting from a claims perspective um and then what specifically is this notice of penalty and forty three thousand dollars a claim like i mean what's a or, or an instance um it seems like that that phrase an instance could be interpreted in a whole lot of different ways like uh, yeah, yeah, and be because this is such a new thing, it, it hasn't been interpreted really. Uh, and so, does it mean every single uh, customer, perhaps, or could it mean one advertising campaign, perhaps? I mean, one if it's every single customer, that's a lot more money than one advertising campaign. But I think there are a lot of issues like that will that will have to be sorted out. You know, what I'm what I'm fearful of is, and I think you alluded to this a few minutes ago. The FTC, if they start bringing cases, they may not bring them against DoorDash and Uber and Amazon out of the gate. They might bring them against smaller companies and build up some favorable decisions. Um, and against, especially those smaller companies, it's really hard to mount the resources to defend against the FTC. It's the same sort of thing that happens with what are called patent trolls or non-practicing entities. They don't actually use a patent, but they own a patent portfolio and they'll sue alleged infringers and those companies will settle cheaply for cost of defense because they can't um, mount the defense or they'll get the plain enough patent holder will get some favorable decisions and then ultimately make their way up to the bigger and bigger fish. I hope that doesn't happen. Um, that, you know, I don't think that would be fair. And look, uh, as you said before, there are bad actors out there. There are definitely um, unscrupulous, greedy, unethical fraudsters. Um, but we need to make sure that, um, you know, that, that there's still due process and that uh, not too many people are caught up in a broad net. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So how, so if, if you're a company on that list, how scared should you be right now? Um, yeah, you should uh, listen to this podcast. <laughs> you should, uh, <laughs> uh, you should review all of your advertising content, your pre-sell pages, your website, your emails, uh, your Facebook, you know, social media, you should review all of it with a fine tooth comb. And obviously an experienced knowledgeable lawyer can help you with that. Uh, and, and maybe pause it until you finish that review. And, and then um, you might have to substantially rewrite some things and it could hurt conversion, but that's better than having everything you've worked to achieve um, eliminated, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I, think, I think people should be concerned. Um, and I'm not trying, I don't like to sort of say the sky is falling and, and um, talk about the, those kinds of things, uh, but it, 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 it is pretty serious. And um, you know, there's a lot of education out there in materials. Uh, the FTC's own materials online, you know, they, they are actually pretty useful. I mean, they, they have a skewed view that's not always consistent with what the courts have said, 
but it's still very good educational instructional material. Uh, do, do you want to talk about some of the things people should be looking for as they try to fix their copy? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that'd be fantastic if you, from, okay. if you can. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the FTC in the, in the press release and in the, um, the sort of example letter, they identify the claims that they're talking about. And the big focus are what are called earnings claims. And that's really statements about how much money someone could make or the type of car they could end up being able to buy or the type of house or being able to retire uh, very soon. Those are called earnings claims. And if the claim is about what someone could do in the future, it's always going to be viewed as high risk because you can't look into a crystal ball and predict the future. And even if it's using words like you may, or it's possible or potential, still high risk because the test isn't the literal words, but it's the idea of the net impression. What's the consumer takeaway? And the FTC's view is that words like could, may, up to, potential, that people read right past that. And they start thinking right. of this as this is likely to happen. You know, the lottery, you know, advertises that you could become you know, a winner and win $50 million if you have the ticket. Well, that's the government, first of all. And they also say that your odds of winning are one in 1 billion. Um, so that's how they're able to get away with that. But the future earnings claims are always going to be high risk, especially, especially if you're using dollar figures or percentages right. of return. Then there are what are called past earnings claims. And those are usually gonna be a lot safer because that happened, it's historical, it's not perspective, it's retrospective. But they have to be substantiated, they, they, they have to be real. And if those past earnings claims aren't typical, but you're picking the examples that really make you look the best, you need to qualify and disclaim that these are outliers, these are success stories, and explain that this is not uh, typical at all. And that's true, not just with uh, the words that come out of the advertiser's own mouth or the financial publisher's own mouth in their ad copy, but also with introducing testimonials, that mm -hmm. this isn't a representative random sample. These are our success stories that using those words can help to qualify that these are outliers. So the- uh, On that one, do you, do you think like, cause I've seen, I've seen a lot, I've seen this from like, I mean, for uh, forever now and, the internet marketing world. I've seen it in um, some of the publishing world on our side, like this this kind of language where it says, where it highlights somebody and it says, and it, and it uses their, their testimonial or even somebody's, a guru's own kind of numbers. And he says in the, in the copy, like, this isn't normal. Most people don't make this, but they, but they always, but they tie it to something like, because most people don't ever really try and learn or they don't, you know, they put like a qualifier in about like the, the person being like really focused or really um, dedicated to learning and mastering this. Um, does that in any way like mitigate that? Um, <clears throat> um, this is so nuanced. And I, I know that's frustrating for a lawyer to say, everyone likes bright lines. So it's hard to talk about in the abstract. Um, the, if you're saying this is uh, this person made a lot of money because they tried and other people haven't because they didn't try, it could be deceptive in the eyes of the FTC because there are lots of reasons why other people didn't make that money, not just because of lack of effort, right? Um, I mean, the, the what, about, what about? Sorry, I'm, I'm like, this is my copy of mine going, but like, I know this is the kind of stuff that a lot of our people are always thinking about. Like when we talk about with, with trading and investing, I mean, like I, I know we've seen stuff where like trading, the reason that you could make profits in trading is because risk is involved, right? Like that's what, that's what trading is. It's risk, um, you're, you're transferring risk. And so the whole concept in the, in the copy sometimes will have people be very overt, like, look, you could lose everything like that you trade. Um, 
and there's no guarantee to the future. So if you have like that kind of strong language, which is very realistic and yeah. ironically actually can be very um, boosting the conversions, not that doesn't hurt. Yeah, it, it shows um, credibility, it's, integrity, it's authenticity. Yeah. Um, right. And so like, I don't, that's where like, like the, the spirit of the FTC, like um, concerns me, not because that they're, they're trying to uh, protect consumers because i think the best publishers and the best trader educators like the ones who are the most concerned and the, and the best about this kind of stuff like they're really concerned about their customer success and, and they're, they're trying to really make this this work for everybody and they do right. say things like that they do say things like look like if you if you only have five thousand dollars in a trading account and that's all you have you should not be trading that's just that's the right. reality of it right like, right um, versus other people who are like, hey, they're marketers and they figured out that there's a way to make money and, and, and like they, they kind of go off the rails. Yep. Um, and so it's kind of like that, taking that upfront approach in your copy where you're, you're talking about the risk, you're talking about the, the, rather than talking about the future earnings, you talk about real stuff in the past. Exactly. Um, you highlight, if you have testimonials, you'll say, you, you put it within the context of like, this is this is an outlier. Um, what if you don't know? I mean, you can't, it's almost impossible to know what the average, like with trading in general, I know. Right? Right. it's almost impossible to know. So how do you contextualize the typicality? Like, how do you even contextualize yeah, that, that? that? That's, that's a tough thing to do. Um, you know, if you ever look at some of the, um, you know, Jenny Craig, weight loss, uh, weight watchers, Nutrislim, they will do surveys and, mm -hmm. and, and, and say that the average participant lost one pound a week over six weeks um, while they have a before and after of someone that lost 10 pounds right. one week, right? Or two weeks. Um, but it's hard to do. And, it, and it, you've got to figure out you know, comparing apples to apples, it, it is a challenge. And, you know, and that's the conversations I have with clients. It's easier if it's a coaching kind of right. um, service as opposed to just financial publishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the kind of legalese disclaimer, but it's more plain English. I'm looking at something right here. You know, testimonials shown are real experiences from paying users of the company. The results are not typical and your experience will vary based upon your effort, education, business model, and market forces beyond our control. We make no earnings claims or return on investment claims and you may not make your money back. So that's, those are the words that we wanna have um, but also the concepts that we, we sprinkle throughout the ad copy. And it doesn't have to sound pessimistic. It can sound just real, authentic, and, and add more credibility. That's, that's, I think that's a great, that's a great um, distinction to make, right, that, that you did just there. That as opposed to things like using kind of what we would call weasel words, like maybe, could, and trying to make the exact same strong claim of like, hey, you're going to be a millionaire. And they say, well, you could be a millionaire. And that's like, it's like this really lazy copy approach, frankly. Um, what you said there is take the language, but then the concepts of it and integrate those concepts of, you know, the future is not predicted, like that, um, of typicality of all those kind of things in there um, and make sure that the copy actually reflects those concepts. Um, that that makes a lot of sense to me. I think I've, I don't think I've heard heard it quite phrased that way before. But just as a as somebody who used to write copy, and I and I, look when I, when I go way back in the early part of my career, like um, I was really um, angry at a client because I knew nothing about trading. I knew nothing about financial. Right. I, I come from mostly like a health kind of copy background and um, a little bit of biz op stuff. That um, but I was very new to the business. Didn't know anything. And I got this. I wrote a promo for somebody and he gave me all these numbers. He gave me all these trading statistics. He gave me all this stuff and um, it worked really well. And I was really proud of it. And it was the first financial piece I ever wrote. And I showed it to this guy that I know who used to, he's a good friend of mine. one of my mentors, actually, he, he used to write trading systems on um, like one of the first auto trading kind of systems on wall street. Right. Um, and he's like, you know, John, this, this, none of this is true. And I'm like, and this was like over a decade ago. And I'm like, what do you mean that this is true? I have all this backup. I have all of this. So I was writing to what the the client had given me um, as saying what, what was possible, what they had done, all this other stuff. Um, but that material 
contain an enormous amount of inaccuracies, inaccuracies, an enormous amount of um, sort ofs that I didn't understand. They didn't make clear, or what they they kind of hid. Um, and so I had this promotion that like I thought was great, uh, and it turned out. And, and for me, it was like a, it was a kind of a um, it was a line in the sand because I'm like I'm not going to be the person who's going to sell people into fraud or or into, into bullshit, frankly. Right. Right. Um, and so I, I kind of told that client, like, I won't work with you anymore. The only way that I'll work with you is if you can find, um, if you can, I want to see the, I want to see the broker statements of every trader you have That's right. um, to start with and that, the whole thing. And, and we started doing that and it actually worked better, obviously, because, but we had to go out and find better quality traders and, and things like that. Um, but it was a, it was a very, like when I, I remember the first time I saw that, it was shocking to me when, when my friend was like, you, you're writing stuff that isn't accurate. Right, um, right, right. It sounds like you would have been a little disillusioned. Uh, and yeah, the people you thought you could trust, you realized they had yeah. a different agenda. Yeah. And 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 I never want to be that person. And most of the people that I know don't want to be that person in the industry. Um, but then you have these weird dynamics, not weird dynamics, but it's just you have you have copywriters who come up learning the art of copy. They don't learn the art of trading and investing. Right. They don't have as much of a knowledge. Um, and there's also, I would say, like there's a, you know, in direct response, you have a uh, you're trained toward to think towards conversion, right. um, and like you get pulled towards higher and higher conversion, um, just because you're looking at the numbers and you're seeing things. And it just uh, if you don't have that strong ethical line, it can pull you away from it. Um, sure. and so yeah. I, I totally recognize that there's a lot of real issues here that the FTC is, is like Operation Income Illusion, like. Everyone that I know in the business had two rea re reactions to it. One was, oh no, what's going to go on? What are they doing? But then at the other time, other side, they're like, they should be looking at that guy because right. people get defended over, over um, fraudulent stuff. And people who have great products in particular get really, really angry when they see somebody succeeding who is like, well, none of that's true. Yeah. Um, and taking yeah. advantage of customers. So, yeah, there, there's a big difference between running an offer and building a brand. Right. And, yeah. and, and even if you're building a brand, if someone goes through and looks at all of your ad copy for the last three years, they'll find some things that probably in hindsight, you shouldn't have said. And, and that's, that's the fear is that if you pick out enough of those tiny little snippets and put them together and say, this is typical, as the FTC sometimes can do, yeah. you'd be in a world of pain. Um, Especially considering the volume of, I mean, just the, the nature of the digital environment, the volume of stuff you have to put out to have a successful business is, right. is enormous. I mean, right. um, absolutely enormous. And then you have, um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. like process yeah. stuff, process yeah. issues, typos, a junior writer. Like I've seen this too, where you have a, a core promo that is absolutely bulletproof. But then you have a junior writer write an email to drive to that promo yep. and they mischaracterize something from that promotion right. email. And you're like, dude, like, what are you doing? Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Financial publishing ad copy right now is not a place to, to bring a lot of um, imagination. <laughs> right. Um, creativity can be okay, but that needs to have its limits too. And uh, yeah. some of the best writers, you know, they have to, they need to restrain those um, parts. I, of their, I, would say, I would say it's actually, so game. we also have this, there's this kind of meta environment in financial publishing that we've had where um, you've had uh, the longest bull market in history coupled with massive trends like crypto, um, right. cannabis, like things like that. And so what we have is a generation of copywriters the younger ones whose entire career is, has existed inside these big bull markets right. and some of the most extreme ones we've ever seen. And at that time when trading basically um, really exploded, online trading really exploded. And a lot of that was income based in the early days. The way that, and so you have all these copywriters who they, they went away from where they didn't learn this older model of promotion where you, where you were doing things like selling basically a macro investment thesis on the investor side. And then you're talking about like the intricacies, like in a very like understandable way of an inefficiency in the market on the trading side and why there's an opportunity there. Um, and so it became much more like, and I don't know if this is because 
for a while the FTC wasn't looking or just the nature of like the cycles of, of um, like I don't think the FTC wasn't looking at the space for a while, um, but it seemed like people could get away with saying things that were very aggressive in terms of income claims. Right. Not that they were incorrect or, or wrong, but they were highlighting, you know, maybe maybe taking a testimonial and not making it typical, um, things right. like that. Uh, and so you had this whole generation of copywriters that learned to write copy that way. Um, and it seemed to be working fine. And then you had people who were much more conservative um, and like, like one would be a great example. He, um, one of my mentors, um, he passed away now, um, Clayton Makepeace. Um, I learned under him, I was his first in-house copywriter back when I was still a copywriter. And I remember him who I, I thought was very hyperbolic um, talking about working with another group. And he's like, those guys at the masters of hype, they say things I could never bring myself to say because he was still selling investment theses, right? He was still mm -hmm. like, there has to be a, a underlying reason for this about the market. And it can't just be about an income opportunity, which for a right. while people were getting away with things like that. And so I, I can see, you know, uh, there's a shift in how copywriters are having to write. Um, and some of the larger publishers have had their, as they put in stricter and stricter and stricter um, copy regulations internally um, or requirements internally, they've had staff exit the business because they're like, well, I can't make my bonuses and the structure under, under right. that. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. Well, let me um, give some examples of, of kind of what we do yeah. when we're, you know, we, we spend time training copywriters. Uh, we spend time looking at, at VSLs and, and making red line edits and suggestions. And it's not just looking at it from a legal lens, but from a business conversion lens. So we can strike a balance because okay. we know companies want to still compete and, uh, and at the same time, they don't want to take unnecessary risk. So, you know, again, the dividing line is future earnings claims are always going to be high risk and you need to uh, red flag those and really stay away from those. Past earnings claims are going to be safer, but we need to make sure we have the substantiation, the brokerage statements, and that we qualify uh, what we're saying to explain when it's not typical. Uh, but there are other things involved in this kind of mix too. So for instance, if the claim is uh, this um, online trading course is easy to learn and will make you money or easy to use to make money, that's a future earnings claim. Now, better thing to say, lower risk would be our online trading system is easy to learn and implement. That's not as uh, exciting maybe, but that's gonna be safer. Um, likewise, to say that uh, a success in a box claim, business in a box, you know, plug and play, to say that you know, these tools will give you everything you need to become a successful trader, that's, that's high risk now. Right. If, you, if instead you say, this online trading system will provide the tools and strategies that have worked for others. So you can implement them in your own trades. It have worked for others. It's no longer future, but it's past. And you can substantiate that. Uh, if you say, this is kind of a nuance in a concept, don't sell the profit, but sell the product. So if instead of saying high risk, my intent today is to help you make $80,000 in the next six months. Now, some people would have argued in the past, okay, well, that's just the person's intent and it's to help you make, it's not a guarantee you will make, that's okay. Well, the FTC would view that as high risk. My intent today is to help you make $80,000 in the next six months. Safer, but maybe it still is positive. My intent today is to show you this product that has helped me make $80,000 in the past six months. Right. They're, they're different, but they're very similar. Uh, mm -hmm. But one can be substantiated. The other is a future earnings claim. Uh, same thing. Uh, you can make 400% overnight or $7,000 in a week. Super high risk. Now, the word can doesn't change the net impression, according to the FTC. It's not you will, it's you can, but the net impression is the same. Better would be, let me show you how one trade made me $2,200 overnight. Historical, can be substantiated. 
uh, bad high risk would be I'm showing you how you can how you can consistently make gains of 400 percent, 600 percent, even 1200 percent in less than a week. Ridiculously high risk. You're putting a target on your back. Much much less risky is let me show you how. Let me show you some of the top gains we've seen from our followers, and you've now talking historic past and you've said top gains, which in a way is a qualifier. This isn't the average, it's the top. Uh, beware of, of outrageous, unfathomable earnings. So, you know, this simulated trade, that's a big issue, right? The simulated trade, yeah. this simulated trade would have earned $750,000 overnight. Maybe that's true because you've simulated it, but it's <laughs> such an outrageous number that you're gonna, right. you're gonna get in trouble. Better to well, say the, sim the simulated trade would have earned $1,200 overnight, right? I'm sorry, you were going to say something, John? That brings up, though, um, so the the concept of uh, substantial, you say that, like, um, it's like there's paper trades, um, there's real trading accounts, there's something I've actually done. There's um, things that happened in the marketplace that I might be talking about or someone might be talking about on me since I basically sell conferences now. Um, but like uh, somebody could like say like, you know, Bitcoin went up this much, um, right? And that's a different thing than my, my personal trade versus a customer trade. Like all of these things, then you have to have some kind of substantiation. Like, what does substantiation kind of look like? What, what, what should should people be thinking about in terms of how to look at um, their their claims and what they have in there? Yeah, yeah. The, the brokerage statements for the trades that you made yourself, uh, for the the simulated trades. You know, again, the backup behind that, and making sure that the copy references. The amount of money, the day the trade started, the day the trade ended, uh, the period of time at issue. If you're talking about something that's you know, publicly available, it's it's pretty easy to substantiate. Right. Um, but if if you say that they, you know, if if they had followed your advice and, <laughs> and bought Uber and Peloton last year they would have made this much money. You need to make sure that you actually recommended Uber and Peloton in last year. And right. uh, you also need to disclose that not all of your picks and many of your picks didn't make money. Right. Yeah. And so, so for each promotion that I'm assuming that most publishers do this and, and just for the people who are listening who maybe aren't doing this, if you have a promotion um, that you should have a document that already has every claim substantiated. You should have a file that already has it done exactly. because um, when the time comes to do it, you don't want to go back and try and figure it out. Like, no, that should be no, part it's of not, it. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not a good look if a regulator shows up at your doorstep and says, what's the backup for this? And you say, can we get back to you in a couple of months? Um, it really should be something that you can produce pretty quickly. I mean, that's it, not a typical scenario that no one's going to be knocking on your door, but yeah, you need to have it before you go live with the promo. You know, with the FTC letters too, there's some areas that um, people haven't really ever focused on that they've taken issue with now. Um, misrepresenting that an opportunity will only be available to a limited number of participants. That's a you know, limited opportunity, only the first 200 people. That might be true if it's, if it's a certain type of program, uh, product service, if it's a you know, seminar at a hotel and, the hotel room only has so many rooms or so many seats. But if it's not true, uh, that's considered to be deceptive. And again, part of the genre of earnings claims of, of tricking people. Um, and also misrepresenting that um, you're pre-screening. If you're like a, you know, business coaching or investment markets coaching, and you only are allowing uh, eligible people who qualify to take this course. If it's true, fine. If it's BS, that's high risk. Uh, and of course, um, misrepresenting that, and again, misrepresenting that people don't need to have much experience to be able to use this or that. 
Right. If that's, uh, you know, to say words like easy, beginner, little, no experience needed, less than 30 seconds, simple. If those things are, are not true, again, that's high risk. Yeah. So, so it sounds like they're going after a lot of the kind of like this. I think of them as market. I think of them as marketing tropes. Like people are like, oh, we, I need, I need scarcity. Check the box, right? So that means I'm going to say, oh, we're only going to sell 500 of these, even though we'll take as many as we want. That's right. Um, it's a digital um, so product, right? Yeah. Right. So it's all the it's it's that kind of like um, marketing. Um, over over customer like the marketing becomes deceptive because you, you you're just putting it in there because you know it works you know it has impact um but it's not real um but that's different than i'm going to make real what about when you say like in some of the services in in, in say uh financial publishing that maybe focus on small cap stocks I, I i was talking to one publisher and he's a really good publisher and he's like you know i won't we won't take for this product we won't take more than a thousand people or 2000 people, I forget what it was, um, because we know that, you know, a, a certain percentage of people, most of them won't probably trade, but because we're thinly traded, it's gonna impact the stock. It's gonna make it hard for the for the service. And so that's just what it is. We, we ourselves have set a hard limit and they stick to it. Yep. That's perfectly that's, fine. That's fine. Because, that's fine because they really do it. Right. Yep. But the, the, the problem is, is saying it and then, well, like that's a really, that's a lot of money we could get with that promotion. Why don't we add an extra three thousand and just say we, you know, that's what's that's right. the problem. That's right. So deception. Yeah, and, um, and everything we've said applies just as much to the outbound telemarketing follow-up call. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the words out of the person's mouth, and, that, and that's hard because it's it might be an outline, might be a script, but people are often freelancing and having a right. conversation. And for anyone, any business that's doing that, you need to have hard and fast rules about what is not allowed what is allowed words to avoid all that it's um there's something called the telemarketing sales rule that's becoming another area like these notice of penalty violations where uh the ftc's looking to, to get forty three thousand dollars for violations of that too and what's what's that rule telemarketing sales rule uh essentially it's that you cannot um misrepresent the offer uh you can't make deceptive claims uh, in telemarketing, mm, okay. um, there there's a case that was brought um, about a year and a half ago against a people search company called My Life, and just last week, the judge in federal court in California granted the FTC's motion for summary judgment in part. Uh, in one of the areas where they found the judge found My Life was liable was because, and this is really, uh, I think, troubling because when people would call in and request a refund, uh, the customer support folks would tell them that the company does not allow refunds, which uh, according to the court in the FTC was deceptive and not disclosing the refund policy accurately pursuant to the TSR, telemarketing sales rule, because in fact, the company would offer refunds if someone used the words BBB, FTC, State Attorney General. <laughs> so by misstating to people we don't offer refunds, that violated the rule. Um, so it, that's yeah. another area where, you know, that's not the subject of this notice, but it's the, but any of the communications by phone in connection with sales, that's that's the same as an email. That's the same as your ad copy. And so you want to make sure that internally people understand what is and is not prohibited, not just your copywriters. Yeah, I think that's one of those areas where, like anybody, um, if you're if you're in business and if you're in an info marketing business of any type, like you just need to understand, like if you look at the path of most most of these um, kind of court actions, it 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 seems to start often with people who weren't refunded, um, complaining and like, we, so we we preach that for years. It's like if somebody, I don't care what your policy is, if somebody comes in and is and angry and wants a refund, you give them a refund. It's it's yeah. it's just good business i mean yeah. you know you have because because that's where your risk is your risk in our in, in this industry is in copy and it's in um uh mm -hmm. refund policy so or, or i would say regulators um because of copy and refund policy right and then your merchant services right so the and and not refunding people leads to more chargebacks and right. so right um, right yeah um, let me make a, just a couple more kind of random points here uh okay. if you're selling 
products on a subscription billing model. There's a federal law called ROSCA that stands for the Restore Online Shoppers Confidence Act. And under that law, you need to make sure you have clear and conspicuous disclosure of the billing terms and cancellation terms on the checkout page. You need to make sure next that the consumer actually agrees to those terms. And third, you need to make sure the consumer has a simple and easy mechanism to cancel their subscription, including being able to do it online uh, under the California statute. Um, and so that's very important. And there again, the FTC is taking the position that they can get up to $43,000 per violation under ROSCA. That's not traditionally been uh, their approach to the statute. And then I guess last is there's the risk of consumer cost class action liability as well. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's an easy way to largely defend against that, protect against that. And that is to make sure that in your website terms of sale, you have class action waiver language and that you have on the checkout page, the consumer agree to those terms of sale with those words hyperlinked. And if you do that, the plaintiff's class action lawyers, they, when they visit your site or the pro se professional plaintiffs, when they visit your site, uh, they won't waste time trying to bring a class action against you. So so say that again, for, because I, I had this conversation with um, somebody not in our industry from who's been coming into our industry recently, and they asked about class action lawsuits. And, and um, I was saying that as our industry mainstreams more, because we're absolutely in, in this kind of mainstream environment, um, I think we, with like 8 million new trading accounts in the last summer or whatever, um, the the class action lawsuits are coming because as we get bigger, as the money's, there's so much money in, in the space that we, we know it's coming. Uh, some, um, some plaintiff's lawyers right now are going through this list and advertising. Right? If you subscribed or bought products in this company, please contact us. Yeah. So um, I think that, um, yeah. So just state that, 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 that disclaimer piece one more time for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So John, I know you're familiar with the e-commerce retailer legal guide. It's actually um, the first section of that guide it has a couple pages okay, on this. We'll post that. Um, I'll have that posted. It's called, yeah, it's one easy way to avoid class actions. It sounds like um, ad copy, but uh, what I was getting at is in your website terms of sale, uh, we want to have mandatory arbitration and a class action waiver provision. And then on the check, you want to have an unchecked checkbox where, where the consumer says, I agree to the terms of sale. And they check a box. Now, sometimes people don't like to have an, an unchecked checkbox. They think that might hurt conversion. I don't think it does because if clients have told me that it, it doesn't affect it at all. And their consumers are going through and filling in their name and their address, their credit card number. It's, it's almost automatic to just check a box. But another way to do it, although not as ironclad, is to have above the, the buy button by clicking buy below, you agree to the terms of sale. And the words okay. terms of sale need to have a hyperlink there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I think that that's been amazing, um, Damon. I really appreciate that. Sure. Taking the time today um, uh, to go over all this with us because I think there's a lot of people out there who are freaked out and so this is super super helpful. Um, and uh, I'm going to post a link to your website underneath the video on the okay. site. We're giving this out to everybody because those of you who, if there's any, those of you out there who still are not getting legal review or you haven't talked to Damon or someone like Damon about your business and had a review of your stuff, like you're at high risk. Like this, the whole industry is getting, getting more visibility. Um, and all of our advertising channels are getting more visibility. And so as you're out there, I think, I think for a long time, a lot of people have thought of obscurity as kind of their legal strategy. <laughs> it's not a good, being obscure is not a legal strategy. And in, in this day and age now, and in, in, in the way that the industry is going, like, it's just not going to be possible anymore. Um, everyone's going to be seen and, and, and um, a regulator is going to be looking at your site at some point is the way everyone should be assuming things are going to go. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I imagine people's heads are swimming right now, are spinning, but there are some fixes and they can be implemented. And you know, we, we do this, John, as you know, we, we do this work every single day so we can be pretty efficient in, in helping yeah. companies strengthen themselves. Yeah, no, and that's fantastic. So I, I really appreciate it, Damon. Um, My pleasure. I'm going to uh, go ahead and stop this recording real quick.